Peace and welcome everyone to What's Up Rody. How are you doing? I am Noelle Jordan, creator and executive producer for What's Up Rody. In my career, I am a live event and touring lighting designer, stage manager, and backline technician. What's Up Rody was created as a safe space for the 12 million strong live entertainment and theatrical professionals. This is a place for us to come and talk it out, whether we're missing the life, analyzing it, or looking for new careers altogether, this is the space where we'll talk about it. Today, we are joined by an amazing panel of women in the entertainment industry, including our mental health advocate. I encourage everyone to engage in the live chat on the What's Up Rody? How You Doing? Facebook Live page. And in today's episode, we're talking about equity in the industry or the lack thereof. Equity is defined as the state quality or ideal of being just, impartial, and fair. So for today's episode, our moderator is Omar Ingram. Omar is the Programs Director for the International Association of Blacks in Dance. He has worked extensively as the association's production manager of their annual conference and festival. Omar is also a graduate of Howard University with a BFA in musical theater and minor in arts administration. Hey, Omar, how are you doing? Well, I'm good. You got me out here. I had to go change my shirt, make sure I represent for all the wonderful Black women out here. So Black women matter. Let me get that out the way. Um, but yeah, I'm good. You, let's jump in. Yeah, let's do it. All right, everybody, uh, welcome to the show. I am going to allow these wonderful panel to introduce themselves. So starting to my right, Miss Ashley Lomax. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley. I am a touring professional and I keep it broad because of how specific it gets. I was an artist for 13 years and still the case. I also host a podcast and a channel on YouTube. Ashley Alexander TV is where you can find it. But in the industry, I've been a VIP coordinator for Live Nation for over 10 years with artists like Janet Jackson, Kanye West, Slipknot, Chris Brown, and many others. I'm also a hospitality coordinator for Chris Brown and Big Three for the past four years. And I recently became a tour manager last year with a newer artist who was newly signed with the international domestic deal and recently finished with the Biden headquarters to victory as we obviously know it. Ms. Crescent Haynes. Hi y'all, uh, my name is Crescent Hanks. I am a freelance live audio engineer and sound designer for theater, film, and television. And a graduate of Howard University. Hey, you. You know. Miss Adrienne McClanahan. Hi everyone, my name is Adrienne. I am a network engineer by trade and I have been doing live virtual events since quarantine started. So, and I've been in IT for 14 years, next month. So. Ms. Chantal Gaynor. Did I get it right? Yes, yes. Hi, I'm Chantal. Um, I am a FAMU grad um, uh, from South <laughs> Florida. Um, I have been a promoter for the last three years with World Entertainment. Um, we, we do touring throughout Florida and in a couple of cities throughout the US. And we've worked with people like Cardi B, Kodak Black, Earth Gang, YBN Corday. Um, as well as underground artists that are looking to kind of break into the touring world. Um, other than that, I'm a photographer and also a marketer. And Dr. Raji Banks. <laughs> Thanks, Omar. Hi, everyone. I'm Raji Banks. Um, I'm a school psychologist and an arts educator. Um, I've worked with youth for over 15 years. I often say my very first job was working at a daycare um, and being the oldest of uh, all my siblings. And so that is where my experience started by trade <clears throat> and it was formalized through training. Um, and in the spirit of Black Women Matter, and this being the first episode uh, since election, shout out to VP Kamala Harris, because I'm a two-time Howard grad, H-U. You know. <laughs> all right. Um, so Noelle has started us off. She defined equity. Just to repeat it, equity is defined as the state quality or ideal of being just, impartial, and fair. 
a little bit more in my notes. The concept of equity is synonymous with fairness and justice. It is helpful to think of equity as not simply a desired state of affairs or a lofty value. To be achieved and sustained, equity needs to be thought of as a structural and systemic concept. Um, so we got all the technical definitions, all the ways that we, we are told equity exists. Um, I'm just going to ask of the panel, what does equity look like to you? So for, um, for me, it, it's definitely in, in that description uh, and in the word equality, just treating everyone just and fairly, regardless of their gender or, or their race, creating the same opportunities um, for people based on skill and not necessarily based on their specific demographics. I think I like the thought that equity for me comes from a space that's natural, like it's a natural skill you have. It's not forced, it's not impressed upon you. It's not something that you just came up with or was influenced by seeing someone else do. Sometimes I think I like equity from a very innate natural space and you can find that and you can see the difference. Let me say it that way. There's the obligation of things but then there's the, the choice of something. And to me, equity is kind of like that. I think equity for me is being able to walk into spaces and seeing other people like me and know that when I'm being seen, I'm being seen for in a workspace anyway for my skills and what I can bring to the table for that production versus um, what they might assume might take, hold me back based on my makeup. So I think equity for me is definitely being able to walk into a space comfortably and know that I belong there and not question just because there are general differences um, between me and another person that that'll affect our ability to, to create and to do work. I like that. I'm going to piggy piggyback off what she said. Equity to me, especially being in IT, it looks like my skill set speaking for me, taking up that space, not, oh my gosh, it's a woman, it's a Black woman. Well, let's, let's put her here in this box. So for me, that, that's what it looks like. Mm. Um, I guess I'll have to say, when I think of equity, I think of social justice. Um, that's like one of the first things that come to mind. And I think what Ashley shared um, resonated with me as well in terms of um, in trying to create equity. It's a humane approach to leveling the playing field. Again, something authentic um, and not forced. Okay, okay, okay. Um, ooh, this humane approach to leveling the playing field did something with me. But I'm gonna go where I was before I come back to that. Um, because Chantal named it in, in seeing other people like me and we talked about walking into spaces and you know, Hamilton, because everybody's still on a Hamilton kid 10 years later. Um, about, good. It's great, yay. Um, <laughs> got like ugly. <laughs> um, let's go down this route of we prepare this thing you want to get in the room where it happens you want to be at the table etc cetera, etc cetera. um and all of you have had opportunities at the table to work and to advance in your in your field um so the question on the floor is what is it like navigating these white male dominated, this white male dominated industry? I'll go first. Um, <laughs> it for, it's lonely, but not in the sense that I'm afraid or I'm intimidated. It's a struggle to find a balance with being heard and ideas being, you know, responded to without Mm. being loud in a way that makes me look like the angry black woman in the room. Like it, it's really hard to get an idea across because again, they've already labeled you when you came in the room. And I've literally been in meetings where I've said an idea 
and it's double, triple checked, but somebody else on the other side of the table will say the same thing. I'm like, and they're just like, it's gold. I'm like, wait, what? We don't, he don't get those same checks, checks, balances. You not going to run it past somebody else. We not going to proofread and stuff. So it, it, that's like an ongoing thing for me. So it, it's not that I'm intimidated. I'm not shrinking, but it's like, okay, how do I show up in this space every day? Make, you know, my presence felt and have my ideas heard without coming across as angry, loud, like that's a, a ebb and flow every day, especially when there's problem problems come up. So I would piggybacking off of Adrian, I would definitely say it's 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 a lot of to do with self-awareness. Like when like how you were saying like you have to think about how you come off with anything that you say, even when you're just, you know, stating an idea that you have um, at a meeting, like it's always being incredibly self-aware, but at the same time, it's like also being willing to be unapologetic at the same time, because if I said what I said, then I said what I said and being able to walk away from that moment and not beat yourself up because you feel like you've been too aggressive because other, you know, other people, other demographics, they're, they're able to do that and walk away and be like, okay, yeah, maybe I was a little mean, maybe I was a little snippy, and they're able to just brush that off their shoulders. But I think for a lot of women of color and a lot of black women, especially, we, we take that home with us. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel like being in this industry, it's, it's learning how to compartmentalize almost in those moments and understand just because there's a perception about who I am, that doesn't necessarily mean that I have to self judge too, if that makes sense. Their judgment, their opinion of me goes through a lot of filters before it actually hits me. So, you know, keeping that in mind at all times is part of that same self awareness that Adrian was kind of talking about. To, to add to it, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm an interesting case because I had the opportunity of having a female family member of color be a tour for two decades before I even got into it for her own stuff and whatever I just was going to be an artist and so I always had it in my head that it's a boys club right but there's black men there too it's a boys club so when I realized once I got a little older the positioning she had in some things and her positions on tours and she was working with legacy acts up until she you know she decided to go on other things and I was like oh okay there's black women there there's black women there at her level doing that specific thing all over the place. Okay. So when I got my first real tour, I was elated because it was the tour manager was female. The road manager was female. It wasn't just the glam team. Most of the glam team were men and, and it was kind of flipped on its head, but everything after that almost had me feeling after a while, like, why didn't you tell me younger that there aren't that many women where you are? And then I've spent years looking for them and counting them and remembering them and that kind of thing. And so for that, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of assumption that we're that we're supposed to be here as assistants and glam and and other things. And what we're navigating through is doing the job for you that you want us to, right? And that's just what you get paid for. But there's something on the other side of knowing I'm not going up the ladder any way that you all will faster, same direction, same ladder. It won't be any of that. And it's, I think, a silent known conversation that's had. And, and I agree with, Chant you know, Chantel in the essence of, Chantel in the essence of, you know, it's not about backing down. It's also not about coming off aggressive. And I think one of the best things about the entertainment industry is it's one of the only spaces where you can talk back at a guy and a guy's not going to say it back to you the same way. But if they did, you're going to brush it off your shoulder because, you know, I got to live on a bus with you for the next mm -hmm. three months. And I know it's almost every job is yours. Your job is yours. You do yours. I do mine. And it's almost equal in a weird sense, if that makes sense. And it's like that space with men might not sound good, but it really is better at the end of a tour when you know the next tour and you see these people again, there's immediate reverence and there's immediate respect. And it's automatically given because I've gone through trenches with her. She's done her own thing, cussed me out and I needed it and kept it pushing. So a lot of times I, I, I'm not the best about being like, let me say it to you twice or answering besides really telling you what I need done. And, and, and I think now that we're in a pandemic where things have shifted, the vets, the vets are at the same space as the college graduates that are in the same space as all of us that are 10, 15 years in. So 
we're all gonna have to do this together. So it would be better if you're nicer to us women. <laughs> so, yeah. well, I'm gonna just before I switch this question to follow where where Ashley just took us. Do we have any other comments in this in this space? Um, I was gonna say, for me, my career started at a with a black crew. Um, even though I was still one of the only women, I wasn't the only black person. And that brought a lot of comfort for me. And it wasn't until after I graduated that I started working with white male dominated um, crew members. And that was uncomfortable for sure. Uh, like the lady said, not seeing yourself in a space, it's, it's uncomfortable and it can be just a slightly intimidating um, just because there isn't that like family vibe that I always felt whenever I'm on a black crew. And so um, for me navigating through those white male spaces, I know I tend to just stick to myself, stick to, to my myself. Um, I'll do the job, you know, I tend to try to do too much just to prove something to them that I, I am just as good as you. But yeah, for, for me, it's, it's about trying to prove something to those white men. Oh, well, look, I found being on I found being on tours that were predominantly a color trickier. It felt like a high school cafeteria of <laughs> hierarchy in a weird way that white tours didn't feel the same. But maybe it's because of the isolation of only being a few there, right? So the odds aren't in your favor for that. But it wasn't until I my fifth or sixth tour, it was a tour predominantly a color. And I was so proud that it was so many people working it until I was like, yo, so many of y'all are rude. Mm. But all of y'all got here. So how can you be so bitter? If it was just one of you on that tour you were on before, you wouldn't be this way. Right. So are we really comfortable or are we really comfortable? Right. And I was just gonna say, you know, I, I'm gonna uphold the emotions and the feelings that you all are sharing because I I can't honestly say, so on the one hand, as an, as an arts educator, having worked in higher ed um, at Howard, um, it was not a male dominated space, but that feeling, like you said, where you expect the family interaction. And it was more of a, I guess, a male dominated group that I was in. And so I felt that gender uh, barrier, right? Um, and I know we'll get to talk about allyship later because that was a, a space where I, I felt supported. Um, however, as a school psychologist, I actually work in a, in a predominantly white uh, female um, industry. Um, but because I've chosen to work with the population that I work with, it's still male, uh, black as far as race is concerned, um, black dominated environment. However, this, I'm gonna just say the sprinkles of uh, white folks that I have worked with in that space, I see how this concept of the, the fact that it is still a white female dominated industry still seeps into the space, even if there are three black women there and there's one white woman you still feel that that uh that racial barrier to some extent because of how everybody kind of moves um based off of space po i just want to uphold because what working in a, a white male dominated space is like that's a gender that's an intersection of gender um and race and so lonely i think was the word that chantel uh chantel mentioned i certainly believe that that is um a feeling that I, I'm just gonna think about as far as that theme throughout our conversation because navigating both has to be super difficult. I was just gonna um, add on, um, my story is similar to Crescent's. When I started at Howard, I started you know, in Crampton was my first, Crampton was my first venue and then my first professional venue was the Howard Theater. And so for a very long time, I just saw black crews. Um, it was either I was the only one on call or it was me and Crescent. Um, but then once I got to Live Nation and the Fillmore, it hit me. I was like, wait, somebody's missing. And it's another one that looks like me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, you do really, like I felt, I felt alone, almost. That lonely feeling of like, y'all don't joke the way that I do. Y'all take it too far. 
like you don't understand you just don't understand like microaggressions and cultural appropriation and just completely inappropriate some things people can say but that is what they're used to in their own community and so it's jumping into that and having that culture shock but then you got to get comfortable with that culture shock because Mm -hmm. this is the way that it is these black like being at a predominantly black or predominantly you know race of color venue that's not that's not where everybody else is so noelle gave me a little alley hoop here the same question we've taken it through some other spaces but let's talk about code switching oh because mm-hmm. now the, the original question came from the lens of, do you code switch when you are with women to men, but race, we're gonna talk about all the intersections. What does that look like when you show up to work? Or does it show up with you? <clears throat> I think I can speak to that because for the first, or I guess about six months into working with World, I ended up getting a full-time job. So I was doing Um, I was a social media strategist by day, had like a regular marketing agency, and then like literally leaving at five o'clock, driving to Orlando to set up for shows or leaving earlier in the day to try and make it in time for um, load-ins and things like that. And that code switching for like two years was exhausting, frankly. Um, I going from doing predominantly hip hop shows and having a black, um, you know, boss and owner of the company that I work for and, you know, having a marketing agency that was predominantly white men, um, that was through a car dealership full of white men selling cars, like that code switching was exhausting on my soul. Um, every day waking up, um, like Noel talked about, like they don't even joke the same way you do. So in the morning you're getting coffee, you're making breakfast, you're getting yourself together for the morning meeting. And you can't even get that, that first morning laugh off your chest. Um, just because the jokes don't hit the same. And I remember, like you said, there'd be inappropriate jokes made amongst two white people, male or female, and they'd be fine, they'd laugh. But if you made a joke that I guess was some cheeky type joke, it was looked at as like inappropriate and out of line. And you wouldn't get the same laughs that maybe your white male coworker would get. So I experienced a lot of that, a lot of code switching, and it was almost a relief to go uh, work for world sometimes on, you know, when I wasn't at my nine to five because my boss was black. And so I was able to kind of confide in him and depend on him for that, that experience because I was just not getting it um, through the nine to five job. And that kind of led me to realizing that this industry and the ability to freelance kind of helps me, you know, create my own spaces. So I don't have to do those things. So currently I don't feel like I have to code switch nearly as much as I did a year and some change ago. Um, I guess on the events end, I haven't had to. Most of the events I've done, people I've worked with, they look like us. They're Black women, they're other Black people, businesses, entertainers, things like that. But at work, oh, at work. (laughs) There are, we have no Black supervisors, not a one. So everything upper management is, they are either old white or old Hispanic, that, that's it. So coming into the office, it's, it's not like we, I literally will remove myself from conversation. I'm like, all right, this joke just went left. They're like, where are you going? Away from here. Cause I don't want to explain why it's inappropriate. I'm just gonna go. And then sometimes they'll catch themselves. They'll be like, and they'll look, they're like, Hedrian is standing right there. I'm like, hey, yeah, that was wild. Could y'all not I'm like, like they'll just like oh because it literally is there's never been a woman i work in a data center like there's no women in engineering so they're just like oh that's not funny no it's not like we two steps from going to hr like you know those videos they make you sit and watch like third party i'm like yeah that's happening right now but i'm an adult and i'm just like y'all do y'all I'm just, it's not but yeah i always have to meetings going having conversations with my manager or his manager it's like all right go in and present it this way then i'll leave and i'll go in my office and a lot of times i don't come out of there like because it's exhausting like i don't want 
to have to present that way all day long. I'm like, all right, I- I'll send it an email. <laughs> I don't even have the energy to come sit in front of you and have this dialogue because we're not going to, like you said, they don't joke the same. Like we can't have, like, you're like let's all go to lunch. Mm, that's, <laughs> that's not insane <laughs> we did. Like, it's okay, I'm, I'm not mad. So it, it's, it's tiring, it, it really is. So it, it helps like to have, and I think before I switched to the data center, I had that, we had other black people like help us. Like there was, my people were there, we'd go to lunch. I could explain a problem in the way only we can and come up with a solution. We'll talk about it, laugh about it and keep it pushing. But yeah, code switching is a lot. And my husband laughs cause he'll hit, we at home now. So he hears my meetings and he's just like, who is that? Like that's work Asian in my business. Let me alone. Like otherwise he was like, I guess. Cause he, he does not, but he works with majority black people. He's got like, they have a white director, but coworkers black. I'm like, so y'all can have that joke, talk to each other, disagree with each other, bump heads, disagree to agree and move on. Like, I can't do that. (laughs) I'm like, that might end up in my file if I disagree, (laughs) disagree the wrong way. So because we are, oh, I hate I'm abraded this way, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to try and figure out a better way. Post George Floyd. Has it gotten better or worse with your coworkers? And I'm going straight to you, Adrian, because you were just met, like, you know, water cooler conversations are what they are. Ooh. And there's a little bit of, we not meeting in person, so I don't really have to be around you unless we hop on a call. But have people been a little more conscious of their, their implicit bias, prejudice, terrible jokes? So they definitely, we don't joke as much because we're not, face-to-face we're hey we're on this call then is this call over because I'm tired of being on here kind of thing but I will say this for my boss like he's you know old redneck that they come sometime but he literally just reached out and was just like are you okay like he didn't know what to say post George so he was just like are you okay and they were like well did he elaborate I said he can put his foot in his mouth so I was happy that he just said are you okay and didn't say anything else like he didn't know what to say so for me that was okay I was just like, I'm fine. You know, we had a back and forth and it was like, all right. Other managers, nobody else really had, you know, a, a, a dialogue about it. It was like, so I appreciate him asking. But I was like, and then of course, the, you know, every country uh, company has their diversity trainings and they have all these different like extra water cooling meetings. Let's talk about it. No, don't want to do this in this setting. Like, I would just like to see some actual change. Like, yeah, we can have all these meetings, but where is the, you know, institutional change that comes with it? Like, are you addressing these people? I've seen people complain. I'm like, so it's, it's weird, but I guess the dialogue hasn't really happened because we're not in the office. It's like, okay, we don't have to have this conversation because we're not seeing each other face to face. We're not passing each other to get coffee. We're not, you know, going down the hall to walk in someone's office. Like, so it's a little weird, but it's, way less joking like because I think a lot of people don't know what to say so they're like let me just not and I appreciate it like just don't if you don't know what to say just that's cool too if I could oh sorry oh I was gonna say if I could hop in I was gonna say um for me it was a in a way it was a relief because I had moved on to freelancing and I work for someone who's black now so for us we got active and we were able to, you know, start working with clients and organizations that, you know, are in the community trying to do what they can and especially educate on top of that as well. So it was kind of cool to see um, my company, which is black owned, but, you know, we also have a white resident, but to see him as well, um, someone who's, you know, he calls himself a redneck, but when the George Floyd situation happened, he saw his partner who was also, you know, his best friend he saw that, you know, the, the pain that we were going through and the, the exhaustion that we were feeling. And so he heard him out and was like, if this is what you want to do, then I support it. And I, I'm just going to back you because I, you know, I believe in you. And so we were able to get active and start working with a lot of different people and are still doing that to now. And it was, it was kind of a good moment for me to look at my white, my white boss, the owner of the company I work for and him, to make that space without hesitation, without question, 
without confusion even just like I know you guys and I know you're in pain and if this is something that is going to make you feel like you're doing right by your community then I'm with it and so he's been with us the whole way learning a lot of different things too but that level of consciousness um, I don't know when I first met him two years ago I don't know if he had so I think that him seeing um, the level of which it went this summer, definitely, um, I, I saw a transformation um, in him. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that. Of course, every white person still has a lot more work to do than just that. But um, I appreciate that he found a way to do something, um, even if nothing sometimes is also the right answer as well. Y'all are really making me think here. <laughs> um, I'm steering a little bit away from, uh, I guess, well, you adding the George Floyd component made me think about, okay, let's go back to the definition of code switching, right? And how I was introduced to code switching. And so for me, it was really just delineating between, you know, being professional, you know, when you're in a space, um, I probably was introduced to this in high school. And it was like, you know, when you're with your friends, you're in class, using complete sentences, um, versus when you're with your friends, leave all the text message, you know, shorthand, with your friends. So just distinguishing between professional and personal. But again, as we talk about how our, this idea of um, navigating spaces and code switching when we are not just interacting within our own communities, it means something a little bit different. It means going into a space, being very conscious about what, how you can operate, what you can say, um, because you don't want to stir up any trouble. But it also means dismissing the craziness that you hear others say which is a whole nother level of code switching, um, you know, that you have to learn, which then changes it from, like I said, how it was introduced when you have to operate in your own internal community, which it can be considered a gift to be able to turn it on, turn it off. It was a gift to more of a survival tactic um, when you get into these workspaces. And so when you think about survival, again, that word to me is connected to trauma. You're constantly responding in a way to avoid experiencing something or letting yourself down, letting your community down. If you're just thinking like, why didn't I say, and I know you asked about George Floyd, but I did think about Sandra Bland and how, you know, her response, had she code switched while she was sitting in the car, you know, her life could have been different. Had she not put out a cigarette, done something that wasn't against the law? Like, did she really have to go at great lengths? Um, and so I, I'm not gonna stare us down that path, but that's literally what I think about is that on the one hand, it's looked at as a gift. However, the way we're describing it in this sense and working in this industry, it sounds more of a, like a survival technique, which explains why it's stressful, it's exhausting. Um, it's not a gift, it doesn't feel like a gift, does it? <laughs> yeah. Mm. No, for and this is not equity. <laughs> right. Not equity when you have to go into a space and, and survive instead of thrive, be who you are. Which I think is like part of the reason why this conversation is, is important is to talk about like, what is, how do we look at equity? What is it that we are setting up? What are, how do we, you all, cause this is about y'all, not really about me, but you all, how do you walk into your space, take what has been given to you, shift it, shake it, figure out how it can be better for those coming up behind you, um, which, oh, look, I just said that. I said, look at me setting some things, working it out. <laughs> um, because what I kind of wanted to, where I wanted to take us um, is more about like those that come after you. Um, and so taking away, ignoring the them, because we, we gave them a lot of a play and they didn't have a lot of play this summer. And hopefully they did a lot of their own personal work um read white fragility if you haven't um and so when we come bring it back to us um you know because we also do a little bit of oh this is mine let me hold on to this um and so how do you all shake that up and and provide opportunities for others um because you know the the field is large but small um and so everybody gets in but somebody may come in as your assistant 10 years down the line, they still may be looking at the same assistant job, maybe in another place, but how do we set others to come up behind us and to also meet us where we are or surpass us? 
you gotta you gotta be what you see and the only way you can see it is if somebody's kind enough to let you in period and women aren't the best with that when it comes to possession and when it comes to competition and when it comes to odds years of doing vip stuff one of the best things that came out of it is because i'm social is is that it's one thing to hire assistance locally from live nation or whoever that has a list of people for me to hire in chicago right it's another thing to have somebody in the vip party and a chick walk up and be like yo how do i do your job like how do you get that job you you i will keep your name and come i'm coming back here two three times a year anyway so if you really mean it do you want me to pay you to watch the show and get fed or do you want to buy your own ticket to the show just promise me you aren't going to take pictures backstage and i'll answer every question you have i've learned after 10 years of people emailing me back and thank yous that most people don't do that. And I didn't know that because this wasn't like my extension came from something uh, of a family or from whatever. I just busted my hump. You couldn't ignore me any further. And then I got in. But when I got in, I was like, I have to do everything in my power to get anyone I know that asks me how you do this to see it. Because if you see what backstage is and you realize it's just a nine to five on wheels and it's not this fantastical place of curtains and security guards and dogs and money. It's none of that. It's really a nine to five on wheels. You will be taken from your family. You will have to make decisions as a woman about your life, children, marriage, timelines, all of that stuff. But you don't know to think this way until someone's kind enough <laughs> to really let you in to see it. Um, so I, I, I believe the only way to, to do it is, especially of people of color, let's remove gender, is you have to push your ego aside and share just a little bit. And what makes things worse is that most of us get into positions and don't need assistance. Like that's why you have me here is because I don't need two of me to do it. That doesn't work either. There's enough money to go around. There's enough experiences to share. There's, there, I mean, there really is. And um, you know, it's hard to see past that selfishness when you think it's just you here. But every city you go to, there's a fan looking at you with your credential, like, oh, how'd you do that? But doesn't have the nerve to say something. And then there's the people who have the balls. What do you do? Who you do it for and how you get there? You should answer them. Every time you're rude and walk past those people, you are snubbing somebody from being where you were. That's how I've learned about it. And I've looked at it, me personally. Yes, same. Definitely. I, I definitely agree with what um, Ashley was saying, creating those, those spaces, opening the door once you're in the room, like specifically like with Live Nation. Once Noelle got on at Live Nation, she she let me in the room. She put me on, I was able to apply and it was it was two black women in that, in that space now. So I definitely think it's, it's you can't be selfish. You have to create the opportunity that was also created for you, for other people. I personally, uh, I don't like the, the term assistant um, because I, I, I feel that it, it caps you like it plateaus your progression like even for with what we're doing with what's up roadie those that have come on to help i'm like you're not an assistant you be an associate producer because that's what you're going to work towards i'm not here for an assistant i'm here to teach you and train you and pour into you just as it was poured into me like i got here just like ashley said i always asked why i asked how i asked um, I would do it this way. So why did you do it that way? Just so I know the alternative. I really think that's a lot of the reason and how you and I met. Like it's one mm -hmm. thing to be, to be pleasant to another woman of color in the room. Be like, oh, what do you do? How you get here? That's cool or whatever. It's another thing to go outside and be like, how you get here? How you get here? Oh, good means perfect. We gonna be great. Then go back in a room and then you got two people looking at people. Hey, why do you go about it that way? Cause I've tried it this way. She's tried it that way. Maybe you should hear how she has it to say. And that's kind of maybe, and Noelle's a great example because she was very instant of one of the few people in a room that was vocal like me. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. she gets it. Because you, you have to be generous and, and emotionally abundant to have the goal to say to somebody of, not of your color, why you do it that way? You notice it hasn't gotten us any results, right? Okay. <laughs> so that's, my, that's how I met Noelle actually under that, that type of environment. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's, I think it's in the name and uh, it also speaks to expectations. That's really why I feel that I don't like the term assistant because your expectation is just to assist me. And that's not why we're here. You can't grow like that.
Oh, I was going to say, um, as far as how to, you know, kind of pull people in the door, I feel like one thing that I tell, um, you know, the world owners, my bosses all the time, I'm like, I am biased. If a, if a, a young black photographer comes to me and is like, I want to shoot your show, your show, and she's a woman, I will choose her if she's good and she qualifies, of course, over anyone else. <laughs> because I've been the young black photographer in the pit surrounded by men and 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 i've been thrown out of pits because i've been accused of not being legitimate though none of the the men in standing in the pit have, have been asked the same question i've been questioned at my own events if i'm someone working when i'm literally you know talking to production and figuring things out and so i always tell um i always tell my boss like yeah if a, if a black woman comes to me a young especially since i'm so young i'm only three years in this game i got barely any skin in it. And if, if she comes to me and she's earnest and she's got the qualifications to do something, I'm gonna just pull her in. And hopefully she swims, you know what I'm saying? And that after that, it, you know, it kind of becomes on her, but the bias is kind of there because I have watched white men give bias for decades, <laughs> um, for literally hundreds of years, if you really wanna look at it and potentially thousands, but I've watched white men give bias. And so I, I have no shame in moments when I have the ability and, and, and the, the room to exercise that kind of power to say, if it's qualified, of course, I don't just pick someone random, but if that woman is qualified to quickly be like, no, we're choosing her over him. And that's what we're going to do today. <laughs> and and I've, never, I've never gone wrong for it. And so um, that's kind of how, it's kind of crazy, but my roommate, how she got into world with us is that she was interested in these things. And I said, just start coming to the shows with us. Just show up. I'll give you things to do. It was never that she, like Noelle was saying, it's never about her being my assistant. It was, I'm going to show you every single thing that I know. And hopefully when we walk into this room with these men, just like Ashley was saying, she's my, my gaslight checker. So she's <laughs> the one who's always behind me. Like, nah, nah, nah. What you said does not make sense. You know, what Chantal said does make sense. And you're not going to sit here and make her feel like what she said doesn't make, you know, isn't valid. And so she became kind of like my gaslight checker. Mm. And, and through that experience, she also became her own in our company and is now taking over things that I have no idea about. And I love that because I never looked at her as my assistant. I just looked at her as like, yo, can you walk through this door? You have some qualifications to walk through the door? Let's go, we'll figure it out on the way. And I feel like sometimes women, we, we hesitate. Like we're kind of like, before I reach down, I got to have like three trophies and this, yeah. this, and this, and like all these weird things that you put on a list that don't really even make any sense um, before you reach down. And I found out that it's like, it's really on that journey vibe where you got to just grab some people that you know and just take them with you and 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 vouch for them, hold it down and and kind of making, you know, your own little circle in it. And, and that's how you continue to open doors. And then those people, you know, it just becomes kind of a branching and spider effect they open other doors that you can walk through and we just keep building and building. And I've, I've thankfully watched, um, since I live in a small town, Tallahassee, Florida, like I watched so many black women that I used to go to local shows with, with local rappers. I've watched them escalate, you know, amazingly in the last couple of years, just because I've watched our group of friends that are women just continue to make those spaces. And so that validates me seeing them excel feeds my ego <laughs> instead of blocking them off feeding my ego, if that makes sense. Makes absolute sense. Uh, another, another fun thing I've learned to insert into this new year and I try to impress upon women, when you have friends working or women that you're working with that you bring along, literally say their name to whoever and say they are with me today. Yeah. Nothing else specific. This is Noelle and she's with me today. This is Chantal and she's with me today. And then if you really get funky, I learned this on the Kanye tour because of how people would introduce me, is that his background singer used to say to me, you got to introduce yourself with the intent of what is your priority. And so he, and you got to get men to do it first. So he would go backstage with me places, let's say, and introduce me to someone and go, this is Ashley. She's a singer songwriter. For us, she's our VIP coordinator in this run. It lifted everything in milliseconds. Like you could see me for me. I didn't have to question it. So I've learned over time that if you prioritize what some what the lady is saying to you and what she wants in this, even if it's the artist, 
<laughs> just as long as you're forthright in really what their intent is and in saying their name because we're lost in this sauce and a lot of people don't see us or they focus on our bodies or they focus on what female we came in this room with and that dictates other things too because if you ain't on your game you'll screw it up for everyone so i've learned that from from other women <laughs> All facts. I think, uh, I guess what I'm getting from what y'all are saying, I love like tying, connecting these dots, um, but it's, it's having the courage to educate and shape. Um, that's what I'm getting from this because we have to understand, and I think about this when I'm working with, when I've worked with a lot of college students, right? And so you get to Howard, you think you made it. And so I have to remind them that while you come with a lot of knowledge, you know, knowledge is power, but you come with a lot of experiences. And so as I reflect on my own experiences of maybe barriers um, that have been like roadblocks to my success, similar to Noel, asking questions and depending on what industry you're in, asking questions is a threat, um, unfortunately. But if we truly believe that knowledge is power, again, this human approach to equity, then you recognize that asking these questions, uh, your business or, or your initiative could truly benefit from someone who's courageous enough to ask these questions. I mean, as kids, you're taught, you know, you didn't know, why didn't you ask? And then it feels like it's the flip, right? As adults, we're like, you ask me these questions, girl. People even try to tell you like, I wanna ask that question if I were you. And it's like, mm, at what point did that flip happen? And so it takes, you know, a courageous black woman who understands that we have all these questions because of the experiences that accompany the knowledge that we have that we might have been taught while we were in college got the degree but you'll never that that still is embedded with those experiences and so in order for us to navigate and truly be successful we we have to toil with both you know the knowledge that we were taught but also pin it up against the experiences that we're having and ask those critical questions and so yeah it, it can be difficult right but you have, we have to be cur courageous enough um the women before us to help shape us, right? I know you're coming in with not a lot, a lot of knowledge. Um, and so if I see that maybe just those little small tweaks need to be made, you know, that's a conversation we can have as opposed to, as they say, throw the whole, whole baby away. You know, she's smart, but she has a lot of questions. So let me go on to someone who actually, you know, I can mold to assist as Noel was saying versus somebody that could really, you know, carry on the legacy and, and expand and advance what it is that I'm doing and not be afraid of that. So I'm a, I'm mindful of time. I'm gonna try and get us two more points. The first question that I will ask of each of you, making an assumption that you are not at the top of where you want to go in your field. What is one question and we're not going to elaborate on them. I just want you to ask the question that you would ask someone higher than you that would help you move a little bit forward. And then I'm going to come back and pick something else up. I've technically done it. And I've asked a, a, a production coordinator who's a vet and white and male, how come all these years of seeing you and hearing your name, not one of your production assistants or production managers have been a color? asked flat out and he runs some of the biggest urban artists that live nation doesn't consider urban they're considered pop right because the politics get separated the further up this this ladder you get on the artist thing no it's urban until you get money 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 and then it's something else right and all of that is fine until you think about it i see it back here and i don't see anyone in your office that looks like me why and he said i don't know <laughs> 30 years later, I don't know. So it'll be different now. I'll go. Um, for me, I've asked, we've had this conversation before me and my boss. I was like, how do I transition my skills to management? Because in IT, that's literally the only way I can hold a door open is to get out of my engineer position. But I'm also in the mindset, I told him, I was like, I don't want to just transition. He's like, you could do project management. I was like, I don't want to transition completely out. I was like, I still like to be hands-on. I was like, I don't, I was like, so how do we make this? I was like, how do, what dots do I need to connect down here? I was like, I ain't trying to take your job. I just need to know how do I move up? Because again, a lot of times managers 
they technical skills them went out the window and people that are very technical don't necessarily translate to good managers, good people. So we've had that. So that that's my question. I was like, because that is my end goal. Because that's, and like I said, I want to open the door. I want to kick it down, hold it. Like I want to be able to make those decisions to bring others in the room, in the building, however I need to do it. So that's that's my ongoing question. Actually, that's the second manager I've asked. Not my direct manager. I've asked other departmental managers, how did you get here? Because your manager but I know you started somewhere else because you've been here for 30 years. You weren't always a manager. I think I, there, for me, there's not a, I don't think there's a specific question that I have. I think I've recognized at this point that in order for me to get where I want to be as a sound designer or as an audio engineer, I know that I just need to work on networking and socializing more with those people that I look up to that are in those spaces where I want to be because I've never felt like people were withholding of information or didn't want to bring me along. It's me also doing my part to create those relationships. So I don't think I have a specific question. Yeah, I got to piggyback off of Crescent. I don't think I'd have any particular question. I'm really kind of stumped by this. I, I feel like it, for me, the main question is, is kind of just like, can I follow you? Like, can I follow you for a day? Can I spend some time with you and your element? And for me, I'm more of a sponge. So just being in that space and in that environment, I feel like I'll pick up on any question. I'll get the answer to any question I might have then. But I do remember um, kind of getting into a conversation with um, someone over at Warner, a high um, Black female exec. And I was like, wow, I've never seen like a label Black female exec of your, you know, I've, didn't even know you existed kind of thing. And so I was like, you know, she pulled up, I think it was in an Escalade rental. And I was like, this is just for you. And she was like, yeah, when you got it like that, you always do it just for you. And that stuck with me. Cause she kind of like kept talking. and was just saying, you know, I am the only black female exec at my label at this level. And so, yes, if I fly down to Florida and I want to drive an Escalade rental, the business is going to pay for it done 10 times more than anybody else on my level to get where I'm at. So if I want a eight seater, <laughs> you know, car for just me and my luggage, then that's what I'm going to get. And I'm, I'm not going to back down from that. I'm not going to have any regrets about it. And so I feel like she answered that question for me about like kind of pampering yourself through your job and enjoying the perks that you see white men and black men kind of enjoy and being like, no, I deserve that too and I'm gonna ask for it and I, it's going to be given to me. And that, that being the end of the conversation. So that was like a powerful answer that I received without even really knowing I was asking or wanting to know. I would say uh, for myself, I don't, I'm not sure if I asked the question, um, but it was definitely answered. Uh, but I wanted to know, this was probably when I first was starting, um, when I was a baby in production. And it was more so like, how do I get to where I'm trying to go? One, knowing that, you know, I have me being a black woman stacked up against me. Um, and then also I, I had physical ailments. So one of the guys on crew, and this was DJ, he said to me, he was like, you need to perfect your neck up work. It was like all that labor and everything else in pushing cases, that's neck down work. Neck up work will sustain you. And from then, that's all that I focused on. So I want to know the console. I want to know, you know, what programs are we using and understand the management mind. Like if I'm trying to manage, I want to be a tour manager. It's like I'm perfecting my neck up work. So that was, that was the question and answer that I got. All right, so I was going to take us to talk about allies, but I really am going to hold the space of like, I just, we gave them too much time already today. Um, so with this last, I think we got about three or four minutes. Let's wrap with y'all. Let's go. Uh, I have a question for Adrian. 
uh, I wanted to know, because I know that Adrian and I, we work together on uh, digital conferences um, and doing digital events. And so Adrian, I really wanted to know how has the expansion been from your day job to the live entertainment digital space? There's a lot more input. Lot, it, there's a lot of people, personalities, Very, there's a lot of that. Whereas my day job, there's none of that. It's, you know, X's and O's, zeros and ones. This is how this works. This doesn't work any other way. Working with you, especially, you know, from your, the production side, you are able to take that. You take all these different inputs, personalities, variations, and help you break it down. And you've made my job a bajillion times easier because as everyone kind of tries to transition to digital events or virtual events, it's always like, does this have to be virtual? Hey, we can do that. No, this particular part of your, your whatever does not have to be virtual. It's not gonna make sense. We don't have to, every aspect doesn't have to be virtual. You can do some things virtually, but everything, it don't have to be. You can postpone it, you, you can. It does not have to be a virtual event or it can be, but not to the same scale as um, in person. So that it's been different, but it's also allowed me to take my, the tech part and be more creative with it. Like, ooh, this particular platform can do this. This software can do this. So we can take your event and still make it really engaging this way. So that's, I get to have a little more fun in the digital virtual event space than at my day job. I have a question for Ashley. Um, what do you like? I know this sounds crazy to say, but what are your signs of burnout? Because you are on tour for months and months at a time dealing with a lot of different personalities, dealing with a lot of new, you know, you're in a different city every night kind of, kind of thing. Like, what are your like moments where you think, oh, I'm, I'm burning out and this is what I need to do before I actually hit burnout and then. Um, it, it comes out in trivial stuff. I'm really pissy about towels, <laughs> right? Like stuff that normally doesn't like, I mean, and I have turned into a towel czar that like everyone will tell you, you got your towels, leave me alone, no more towels, right? But I think my signs of burnout start, I'm not a homebody. Quite frankly, honestly, I don't miss people that are living. I can find you where I can call you. I can see you. So for my burnouts coming to when I start longing for things I normally don't, like I, I'm not a, I wanna go home person. Mm -hmm. I feel burnt out when I'm snippy at somebody or I know someone's a vegetarian and like, I like gave the wrong vegetarian meal to the wrong bus and they've got right to say something to me, but because it's my job to do it right. But my bark back being so feverish wasn't at you. I am. I think I've seen the same 60 faces for four months. I've seen these venue faces three times a year, the same venues, the same faces. So it's just the crew changes, the movement's the same. So for me, my burnout comes out with uh, on days off. If I don't actually choose to sleep, like I'll try to obnoxiously sleep because it's the day I have it. I'm not in a bunk. I don't have to do something for sure tomorrow at 7 a.m. And if I don't rest, and I just want to run around, go eat, go hang out, go shop and whatever. I'm burning myself out on the day that I'm supposed to be fixing my burnouts or to curb the burnout. So a lot of it for me is getting short tempered in spaces I know I'm not. There's spaces I know I'm short tempered, but there's a lot more spaces where I'm very adaptable and normally very pleasant. Um, and if I get calls from home of stuff that normally wouldn't bother me any, and I'm just like, why'd you call me with that? That makes no sense. Da -da -da -da. It's incorrect prioritization and it's incorrect emotional intelligence. And so for me, my burnout, my burnout is known. If I like, if I'm begging for a Twix and a Canada Dry Ginger Ale, I've hit the end of my day and I need you to save it. Please get me a Canada Dry Ginger Ale. I don't want a bold. Just get me a can. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, do you think I'm kidding? Crew people will tell you, yo, if I if I ain't in it, they will slide a Twix in my bunk. <laughs> and I will come out, <laughs> come out and be nice. Front lounge, how's everybody's day? You know, like, um, and burnout's real, but I didn't know about it until the pandemic. This is the longest I've been home in, in 10 years. And there is no burnout, like being somewhere that you haven't seen, that has changed, 
that is a part of you, but not a part of you. So my burnout really came in the pandemic with nothing to do. You hear what I'm saying? I got all day to sleep. I got all day to garden. I got all day to do whatever. I don't want to do any of it. I want to be mad at towels really <laughs> bad. You know, <laughs> I want towels and food. So Yo, uh, I hope towel. that helps, yeah. but you won't burn out, baby. You're so new into this. You got years under your belt. Trust me before you feel a burnout. I promise you. I felt that because mine is ginger ale and chocolate. Everybody knows it's the end of the day. If I can get a ginger ale and chocolate, I can like you for about five minutes. Right. I got it in the tank. I promise you. You <laughs> might even get 30. And then 30 minutes at the end of it, shut it down. Let's be done. Let's go. Tomorrow. <laughs> um, and I'm really mad we got to end because it is now we we are we are past our time and the well sending me little messages. Like toss it back to her, but I'm gonna first say thank you, ladies. This was a pleasure uh, to support Black women in this forum today. Um, and honor is all mine. Noelle, back to you. Omar, uh, everyone, I want to piggyback off of Omar. I just want to thank you again uh, for your time and your insight, uh, as well to all of you that are watching. Um, everyone. I want you to have a safe and blessed Thanksgiving that's coming up. Uh, and we will be back in a few weeks where we will be breaking down equity in theater, live events, and digital events, live concerts and digital events. So be sure to follow the What's Up Roadie Facebook and Instagram pages for up-to-date information on upcoming discussions. Again, Ashley, Omar, Crescent, Adrian, Chantal, and Raji, I thank you all and peace.